conversation that we're about to have. Uh, we want to hear everyone's thoughts, and we have a democratic process in the form of a survey um, where the filmmaker will read um, everyone's thoughts and feedback. Um, so I'm sure this film has inspired lots of feelings and reflections. So this QR code that's on screen links to a really interactive survey um, called DocScale. And it's something that's created by TBS, one of our partners in California. And you can see other people's comments as well, um, not in terms of names and things. This is anonymous, uh, but you are invited to join kind of a newsletter after. Uh, so that we can stay in touch and things like that. Um, so I'm going to leave, just give you all uh, about two minutes to complete this. And then we're going to have a conversation with the filmmaker who is just arrived in Atlanta today. So um, she's very excited to speak with you. Um, so while you all are completing that survey, we are going to get the mic set up and get the conversation rolling. So I would like to introduce the Executive Director of the Council for Korean Americans, Abraham Kim. Can you please give him a warm welcome? three or four times in this film. Uh, we have, uh, and really reflecting on uh, not only family, but also our community and, and civic engagement as well. And, and of course, uh, race relations and, and so many other uh, important issues that uh, this film really touches upon. Uh, tonight, we are really honored to actually have Soyeon here with us. Uh, she just arrived literally half an hour ago. <laughs> But just really quickly, uh, you know, Soyeon Hum is a Korean American director and producer uh, based here, uh, based in Los Angeles, and she explores the intimate and challenging stories of marginalized people with piercing humanity and poignant entity style. Um, Liquor Story Dream was her uh, director debut on the documentary feature film, uh, and so, and it was premiered at uh, the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival. And since then, she's been to the Tribeca Film Festival, who's on the International Film Festival, the BFI in London. And the film also is up for, um, has picked up uh, a number of nominations and, and also awards along the way in film festivals, uh, such as the Indie Street Film Festival, uh, the, um, the, Law, uh, the Law Film Festival, uh, the, the Florida Film Festival, the Palm, uh, Palm Spring International Film, and, and others. And so we're so honored to have her uh, with us this evening. Um, I'm, we're going to have a fireside chat, just about you know, 10, uh, about 15 minutes, uh, but we want to also listen uh, to questions from you. And so please prepare your questions, and then we'll, we'll open up the floor uh, for Q&A uh, after a uh, brief conversation. So with that, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're so glad to have you here, and I know it's kind of, you just rolled off the plane, so I'm, last thing you probably want is a microphone in your face. but. We're so honored to have you. So, so um, just to kick it off, um, just to, like big picture, um, you stated in the film uh, that that all the shame and rage growing up in the liquor store fueled your desire to film life in this place. Now, can you unpack that statement and really what was the impetus for this film? What what made you decide that wow, I want to make this film? Well, first, thank you so much for coming. Uh, um, I think for me, so I, I uh, when I was starting out, I went through a fellowship called Arm with the Camera, and they required me to make a short five-minute doc. And I think with the limited budget that I had, I was like, I kind of always wanted to make a short about me and my father, which turned out to be when we store babies. And I think that short did really, really well. And 
people kept making, asking me to make a feature length film, which to me I didn't understand what that meant, um, just because I didn't, I couldn't see a path. I was just starting in film, so I think I was just trying to think in the most realistic way. And for me, I just wanted to make my favorite movie and. Uh, a film that could add to the dialogue because I didn't want to make a film that already existed and this is a film that didn't exist from the Korean American um, POV as well as us talking about the 90s LA uprising. I feel like a lot of the media always covers it from like obviously the white perspective or the media's perspective of what happened and like Korean Americans are in the peripheral or they're just not even talked about and so I think for me um, that was kind of my urge to to confront a lot of these shameful feelings that I had uh, growing up in a liquor store, but also the liquor store also is a, such a loaded and has so much history within Los Angeles. Um, because of course, when you trace it back to the 90s LA uprising, so I think that was something that I just always wanted to confront personally, as well as that was a dialogue that I wanted to add to film and just the general conversation. I'm, uh, you, you mentioned that your original short film was called Liquor Store of Babies, but you turned you changed the title to Liquor Store of Dreams. And, and it's, it's an interesting kind of play on the words uh, because there are a lot of dreams that are being talked about in your film. It's not only just your dream, which you said, I have big dreams, that's kind of how you started the film. But there are so many other dreams, and even nightmares, right? Good dreams and bad dreams linked to the liquor store. And um, I, I'm curious uh, how you came about naming this film uh, as a result of all these experiences. I was driving one day, and I, it just came to me. And it was so weird, because the name doesn't really exist anywhere. It's something I kind of made up. And of course, it has a play on the American dream. What does it mean to have a liquor store dream? You know, it's like, what is that? But I also think it can mean that so many of us immigrants own businesses, and this is just another business. And I think that so much of our hopes and dreams are put into a business, and life. It's, it's our livelihood, it's our life and death, and I think that is something I wanted to show. And also have a name pretty catchy so people can instantly remember it. Um, I wanted to ask about Danny, too. And, uh, in the film, you said you had grown up with Danny. And uh, there were so many kind of poignant moments for him, and so sort the of epiphanies too. And um, you know, as a, I guess as a filmmaker, what did you learn through Danny's story? What were um, what was the you know how was that experience journey with him, having two parallel lives in the other story? Because I always saw Danny as somebody who we almost grew up exactly the same, but. We are obviously very different people. I think for me, I, I, I'm like everybody else. I kind of want to grow up, I make money, just like live my life. Whereas Danny is such a unique person. I think when he even told me that he, he was going to run tonight, I just thought it was such an insane idea. Like, why would you do that? Like, we all drive. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't, it's, it, it's, a, it's a thought that you could never just, um, I guess, execute and I think for Danny he's just that kind of person he just thinks the impossible and he does it and so I think I needed a polar opposite in my film whereas um, we are both going down the same path in very different ways and struggling with very different things and that's some I, I felt like I always needed him because even in my short film uh, the I got was but I'm the I'm one of the characters and I'm because I'm the filmmaker I can't only have Danny, and then when there's too much of me, it, it didn't make sense. Why am I only telling my story? So I think I always see myself as a vehicle to tell both Danny and my dad's story, because it wouldn't, neither of our stories would make sense if we didn't have one another. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, not only Danny, but I mean, there's a lot of very difficult stories that you tell, but it's really the mental and emotional processing the daily dangers of um, not only your parents, but also of uh, first-generation liquor store owners. 
And um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, how, what did you learn about the fear as you're exploring these intergenerational melting tensions, but also learning about the struggles that they went through, right? And I'm wondering, you, you personally, are there, what did you learn through this process, through this intergenerational relationship? Of course, I, I would like to think that if I never made this film, I would never know my dad to the extent that I know him, just because I would never have been able to allow myself or given myself the chance to get to know him in this way. I always say that I could only get to know him because I had a camera in between us, mediating us. And I think that was really important. I always urge people, if you want to get to know your parents, just film them <laughs> and have tough conversations because at least then it's still awkward that you're filming, but at least you're having the conversation. And I think I just got to know them in a deeper level than I would have ever anticipated otherwise. I'm wondering if there are um, actually, I want to ask the audience a question. How many of you actually are liquor store children of like small business or liquor store? Maybe a couple in the audience. Um, I, I'm, wondering, I'm curious if, if uh, can, are there any long lasting impact on children of liquor store? Can you tell when you talk to someone that you grew up in a liquor store? I think a lot of them hate it. <laughs> just because either they were forced into it or a lot of them just have really bad memories and this is why Danny's also an unlikely story because nobody likes it as much as he does. There's a lot of second gens that have taken over their parents' door and revitalized it, made it really updated and hit and they're doing really amazing and I think for them it, it's working it, it's worked out because it was their decision whereas I feel like a lot of the people that I meet were like yeah or it's kind of like very positive like my parents own the store and then they move on yeah. or things like that but I feel like the people that have been in it longer they do have a, they do have a bit of resentment or bad memories like I do so you must have had I'm sure you, you've shown this film throughout Los Angeles and Southern California. Well, what's the response been of, of others who have had a similar experience as you? Have, have you had any surprising responses from the audience? Yes and no, just because I felt like if I explained my experience, people would know it immediately. So I think for them, they were like, this is exactly everything that I, I felt, everything that... Um, how I wanted to be seen, and they just felt really, they related to it so much because it was their lives kind of like exposed yeah. on the screen. Um, you also explored the question of uh, the black community and the Korean American community and the relationship and the turbulent journey between these two communities, uh, particularly in the Southern California area. Um, what have you learned personally through this process about this relationship? And, do you have any recommendations? I mean, you, you did mention talk about it in the film, but I'm wondering if there are other things that you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with our audience about how do, how do we change the narrative? How do we reconcile these relationships? The only reason why I made this film also is because so much of the media wants to pit two communities together because they want to like tire us out, so we're like not focusing on white supremacy. So I think a lot of it was to show real relationships and real friendships and real solidarity because I think so much of, um, this is why I don't believe everything the media says because it's not obviously from an authentic perspective, they also have a different agenda and I am always trying to be mindful of that um, because when you see, say, any anti-Asian hate crime happen, like that will get more traction than if the headline was Black and Korean Solidarity or Black and Asian Solidarity. Like people will be like, who cares? Why is this news? So I think that because it's not widely seen, people think it doesn't exist when it actually does. And to me, it's just about continuously amplifying it, continuously like showing up and showing people that we're here. Because I think that so much, especially Asian Americans, we are always kind of, at least for me, I always feel like sidelined uh, or ignored or we're kind of not even part of the equation. 
because it's usually either black or white. And so we're kind of in the peripheral, like how it was. And so I think for us, and at least my community in LA, we always want to try to show up and show people that, hey, we're actually part of the action. We're here, whether regardless of which protest it is, like <coughs> people always say, well, Asian, you know, Asian people don't protest or show up into these things. I'm like, very small amount of us do, but I also know that there's different ways to participate. You don't always have to partake in protests. You can, um, I always see myself as a messenger to get the word out. So that's kind of my role in, the so in social justice in general, as a storyteller and uh, in a sense a disruptor to disrupt the narrative that has been harmful and kind of used against us. True. Do you think the stereotype regarding Korean American personal has changed since you made the film? It has changed because now you don't see movies like that anymore. Because also more, less Korean Americans own liquor stores now, more um, Middle Eastern uh, union members own liquor stores. I think we will see that more. Um, but I also know that they have a very good history. And so I don't know if the same problems that we dealt with will exist and pass on to them. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask some questions around some of your artistic choices and some of the scenes. There's a lot of eating scenes. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that was intentional and why, why the eating scenes? Because I think most of us, we don't talk to our parents, but we'll eat with them. And that was really important. And also it was my response to a lot of Hollywood films where they showed eating scenes and the food just looked really bad. So I think for me, I was like, I want to show really good, authentic Korean food, as well as uh, show the dynamics of me and my parents. I feel like we are the most authentic when we are ready. And, um, and also, uh, it's interesting, I guess, you started your whole film by your father using the camera and you're just kind of she's trying to focus on you. I wonder if that was intentional where the beginning and setting the stage of like you're trying to get your father to understand you more clearly and that was all that was kind of symbolic. Like, was that intentional or? I don't know if I gave him the camera thinking, oh he's gonna understand me now, but I think I wanted him to just try it out. Because I know that he kept saying, oh, filmmaking is very hard. It's harder It's harder than owning a liquor store, which obviously from my perspective, it's not. Mm -hmm. But for him, he thinks it is. So I think that was something that I just wanted to play with. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to give opportunity for our audience as well to uh, ask questions. Uh, so as you're preparing your question, I'm going to ask, um, I guess, uh, one, uh, one final question uh, here is, uh, how's, how are your parents doing? They're good. My dad is fully retired now, so he is golfing a lot. And I think he took the last two years after uh, entering retirement to figure out like, what his passions are, who he is outside of work, because I feel like so much of our identity is tied to work and productivity. So I think that um, I also told them I would give them a call. So you guys can say hi. <laughs> While you're typing that, I'm wondering if you can how of course, you know, and... It's the only way, it's the only uh, way we really communicate. And it's great because it has emoji, so if you don't want to, I can't, my Korean's not that great. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice that I could yeah, yeah. send an emoji. Hopefully he answers. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 Well, 
이렇게 어, 저기 바쁘시는데 어, 바쁘시 그러시는데 이렇게 와서 저희와 봐주셔서 너무너무 아, 감사드리고요. 그리고 저기 봐. 어, He said, "Thank you for coming out of your busy schedule." <웃음> 
that was really hard. Um, trying to get people to believe in your vision when you don't have a background, you you don't haven't made like a really good doc before, and then it's just like a lot of. Um, I guess barriers in a sense. So after I made the 30K, I applied to uh, grants for the next two years, got rejected for three years straight, and then Sundance came in with like 40K. And to me, I'm like, getting support from Sundance meant so much because obviously they're also the most widely respected in film in general. So it really meant a lot that they were the first and almost the biggest organizations to come in and support us. And then, of course, when Sundance supported us, a little, you know, other foundations supported us, but honestly, we made this super low budget, and I had to learn how to film, because we couldn't pay people. It was also COVID, so a lot of it, we were isolated. A lot of my um, camera people moved careers, and so they just completely got out of the business. Um, and then we, once we got into Tribeca, then we ended up getting a film sales agent. So the film sales people will submit to film festivals on your behalf. So I did submit to a few, but it wasn't until Tribeca that they kind of did it. And uh, I think we applied to over, yeah, probably over 20 or more. And we got in over 20 or more. But I think that it's been really, I mean, the fact that we even got to Korea, that was kind of a miracle because I always felt that Korean people don't really care about Korean American stories. That's how I felt. But they really proved me wrong when they invited us and I was like so thankful and just seeing what Korean people think and their reception was like the, the greatest gift in a sense. And so since then we were able to go to Korea twice and show it in different um, cities. If you can identify yourself and then ask your question, that would be Hi, my name is Lauren McClark. I'm a writer, editor, and journalist here from Atlanta, born and raised. The question I have for you is, in your matriculation in California and in the work that you do in researching about Black American and Korean American relations, have you come across, or do you intend to come across, examining um, intercultural reactions, looking at Black American culture in California and Korean American culture, examining the intercultural relations um, between amongst uh, Korean American women and Black American women? I say this mainly because so often when people talk about this topic, right, it's often in the guise of racism, social justice, something bad happening, right? In order for two cultures to get to know each other, some, there has to be, something bad has to happen, right? But have you ever um, thought about or planned to examine, and let's just look at two cultures and any cross-cultural interaction. I'm also talking specifically looking at black American women and Korean women, Korean American women in that area. If they engaged in cross-cultural dynamics, looking at their traditional culinary, their arts, their storytelling, their quilt-making, uh, the stories of their matrilineal line, of their mothers and grandmothers, and how these interconnect. Uh, this is just a question that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, I feel like the that topic is like level five. I feel like <laughs> because it did, like even this film didn't exist, in the zeitgeist of films, I had to start at the bare bones. Like even before I had to, I could even talk about Korean and Black relations. I needed to talk about us and our parents first, mm -hmm. because there was so much unpacking for them to do that even before I uh, want to bring two communities together, I need to be able to go through this journey with my own father, unpack what his traumas are, and then have him confront exactly why he thinks certain. Are, are, a certain way and why there's also this gap between even us, not even between him and the black community, it's like between us. And I think, you know, they always say change starts with you first, so I think that's kind of what I wanted to do is that before I can even change him, I have to like figure out how to change myself as well as in, in the process. Before, in a sense, like throwing two different people, different communities together and being like, all right, you guys get along now. You know, like I think that 
I wish I could do that, and that's kind of the, a lot of the impact work that we were hoping to do, we want to get to that level. But first, we're like, okay, let's create a space, safe space, especially for liquor store owners, to like get out whatever your troubles are, your biases, whatever, like talk about it, just so we can talk about it. Because so much of it is not talked about, they're just kind of like throwing stuff here and there, and so much is, so much of it is biased, and so much of it is obviously in their perspective, but I also think that that's why we're having an intergenerational dialogue with children as well as the parents. I think that in the future, I would like to explore more. Like, I think so much of, especially even in media and film, we have, like, is we're really just scratching the surface, and I think that's like the, the place I would like to go eventually. Hi, I'm Jay Lee. Um, so I grew up in Mississippi um, and spent most of my adulthood in New York. Just moved to Atlanta about a year and a half ago. Um, and so I was really struck by um, the conversations that you were having with your father about um, race relations and just, um, I thought it was very brave um, that you would choose to put that much of your <laughs> your life and your conversations with your dad um, in the documentary. Um, and I, I just very, I felt very strongly um, those memories of like having those conversations about sexuality and race and you know everything with my parents and grandparents in Mississippi. You know having been in New York for so long, um, and so I was just um, curious. Where did where did you land with him? Like, did, was there any movement on his thoughts as far as you know? Uh, I mean, one line that really got was really strong to me was you know him talking about you know because I, I, I have had these same conversations, but you know the notion of like if you do something wrong, then you deserve to die. You know, like that kind of. Um, and you trying to talk him through, well, even if she, even if she did still, then what, you know? Um, so like those kinds of things, I mean, I, I felt it was probably more powerful that you left it open-ended, but I'm curious, and today, like, how, where is he? I mean, even he? that conversation, we like fought for like 20 plus minutes, yeah. just back and forth, and I think so much of it was, we're not, I don't, like, he's saying you're wrong, and I'm saying you're wrong, how are we going to get to a happy medium? Like, we're not. I don't think that we got to any conclusion in that conversation. I think I was glad that we even had it because we never really talked about it. And so we're, like, okay, we're going to have to go there, like, there now. Um, and so I'm glad that that was the first time and that we even was a, we were able to even have that conversation because then usually we would just be like, mm, okay, like, well, we won't talk about it. Um, I think change happens really slowly, and like unpacking and go, unpacking your biases, especially if they're from your lived experience, is really tough. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's something that he goes through. And I think with more exposure, talking to more black people, it just like different seeing different things will like change perspectives too. And so much of I mean, it's hard because like he doesn't. We live such different lives, like, I'm traveling all the time, I meet so many different people, and like, everybody's so different. But for him, he's just seeing this one thing, he's only watching one type of media, he's just being kind of fed the same, as if it was like Fox News everywhere, you know? Like, how do you decipher, or how do you think clearly through that? And I think it, it's just been slow. Like, I'll, we've been having more events, um, especially at Skid Row, so we'll see different People, he'll talk to different people, but it's also the language barrier. He cannot have these conversations. <clears throat> and even if, I always say, even if my Korean was amazing, like, I don't think, wait, is that the answer? I don't know. Like, I think that I've been trying to expose him to different perspectives and books that are translated in Korean so you can see, like, hey, this, this exists. Mm -hmm. There's, like, I think when I talk, when I try to, explain what, like systematic racism, like there's things like bigger than us that are working against us, it's kind of like trying to explain to a fish 
that there's water. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what do you mean? Like, I don't understand. He doesn't see it. I think, of course, for us, it took so long to see, okay, like, you know, the police are racist. Like, they're trying to, like, they have put on me. Or, like, there's, like, a lot of these things that are happening in the background. But I think for him, it's like, just work hard. Mm -hmm. I also necessarily don't think working hard will help us in any way. Um, I think it's also a myth that it's just been force-fed so much to keep us down. To be, we're working so hard to survive that we're not thinking about anything else. So... That's very, very a, thank you. Okay. I was just wanted to acknowledge that that's a very um, that that's common in a lot of cultures. Mm -hmm. Just like just do put, keep your head down and work hard. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry about everything else. You know. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. So right here, and then we'll have a question over there. Hello. Oh, am I next? Oh no, yes, please. Oh. Yes. Hi. Here I am, in, surrounded by a lot of Korean immigrants. My, I'm a Jamaican immigrant, and here's my first generation middle daughter. And this story is so similar to our lives. Here I am, I feel comfortable being an immigrant, you know, and just, because my daughter, she kept just you know, saying so many things that you know, just resonate with both of us. You may know my oldest daughter, Janelle Brown. She's a <laughs> yes, at CalArts. Oh. Yes, Janelle's mother and sister. Does she know you came here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. So, um, but let me tell your dad, he'd be happy to know that they collaborated and designed a class together for Emory University. And they used your film and a love song for Latasha Harlins. The, as a part of the class. So I feel very comfortable saying this surrounded by immigrant parents because we know, you know, you know what it feels like. And she says, she, no, 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 I know what it feels like being around me all the time. But yes, so I, I really love this story. This is my second time watching it. Oh I watched God, it. So yes, I watched it when it came out originally on PBS. And I was very excited to tell Janelle that I was watching it. Yes, but I, I can't wait. I gotta see the curriculum of this. Amazing. Sure, I can. I can read you a discussion post from my yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is from Emily Emily uh, Choi. Um, she says, so we, they watch liquor store dreams and love song for Latasha together, and the class was called oh, Black Feminism for Holly uh, to the woman. To the person who asked the question before. Also, in part two, I'd be really interested in beauty supply stores because for you us, know what? A, I would like to see. What I, it's some, I think I always think like, oh, who's gonna do it? Because obviously this was about my life, so I can do it. Yeah. But like, I, because I did broken a uh, beauty supply store. I'm like, who's gonna? Because I know there was Chris Rock's good hair. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, okay, let's see like the other side too as well. Right. But. I've just been waiting, so I'm like, mm. <laughs> If you've ever watched Kong for Jesus Save Your Soul, our Korean beauty supply store was on the exact opposite. It's on the same street of where they're doing the honking. Oh, it's literally on that. Yeah, so, um, but uh, Emily Choi says, throughout the videos, I focus on the racial tension existing between two discriminated groups. These two videos shed light on the tension between two racial groups, Koreans and African Americans in LA. I noticed that both these groups are considered minorities and low-income communities and they are heavy racial pressure in their everyday lives, often turning their anger toward each other. This made me think about my standpoint in race and class. Although I'm also Korean, like those shown in the Thursor dreams, I face less discrimination as they are more exposed to direct racial mistreatments during their services and live in constant fear of racial insults, as mentioned in the video. This exposure often makes those Koreans in LA develop stereotypes towards African Americans and remain ignorant to the truths behind Latasha's death as shown, in, as shown by the father in liquor store dreams. Our different backgrounds and my parents' occupation have put me in a different class despite being the same race, resulting in completely different lifestyles and perception of race. And I also just want to say most of my students reacted to the scene of your dad watching himself in the film back. I thought that they would be reacting to something else, but him sitting down and watching what it. What did they say? <laughs> it was important, first of all, it was important for them to see how you communicate with your dad. So like, even though your Korean isn't as fluent as your dad, 
like the actual sort of translation going back and forth, and they just were surprised that at his reflection and introspection. They're like, we're not used to our parents like reflecting back, or that we can even prompt that. Sure. I've got some responses that my dad is way more open yes. than most dads, so I, I think it it worked for the story, but also I'm <coughs> having this conversation. I think that if my dad was not obviously not like this, we, this film probably wouldn't exist because he would just he would just walk away, <laughs> or I would just walk away, and I think that's kind of yeah. We have a we have a young lady here, and then we have a gentleman back there, and then another gentleman up here. So. Hi, I'm just wanting to thank you for helping me with my dad's book. Um, I think it's I think I didn't know till I was older, just because I think for me, I wasn't really good at school. I was really bad at school. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I, but I wanted to change the world somehow. I tried to figure out what could that be. And so I figured out, I always think, I try to do like what I'm good at. I like talking to people and sharing stories. And so that's kind of, how I landed on this, and I really like movies. Um, so I didn't know till I was probably in my 20s, after college, <laughs> that I wanted to do this. Thank you, for that question. Joe, back there. John Korean News, Kim Gi Jae. I'm speaking English. Can you speak English? 네, 저 구독자가 전부 다 한국 사람이라 영어를 한번 못 알아들어요. 첫 번째 질문, 이 영화를 만든 동기. 이 영화가 제가 보기에는 한 번에 다 만든 게 아니고 몇 년에 걸려서 만든 것 같은데 그 동기 좀 얘기해 주시고 그 다음에 본인 제네레이션에서 한국 아빠 엄마들하고의 이걸 만드는 것과의 관계. 어, 우리 2세, 3세들이 부모들하고 대화하는 굉장히 힘들잖아요, 그죠? 근데 이걸 보므로서 내가 볼 때는 엄마 아빠하고 가까이 지낸 거 그런 게 많이 보이거든요. 근데 본인이 느낀 점 그걸 다 한국 말로 해주세요. 네. So the first question was, um, what was how many years it took, or what was the purpose? What was the purpose of creating the trigger? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so he wanted me to answer in Korean, which I'll hide. Um, so I can interpret it for you too. Oh, really? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, he said the viewership is yes. usually Korean, so it would be nice if you can answer in Korean, but we can always. <laughs> Let me see. I, I'm just trying to figure out. 이, 이 영화, 이 영화가, because it didn't exist, and 한국 사람 입장으로 이런 이야기 한번 아, 보여주고 싶었어요. 왜냐면 영화 볼때 이런 한국단, 한국 국민에 대해서 아, 한 번도 안 보인 것 같아서 만들었어요. <laughs> that was great. That's and 촬영, 촬영하고 편집하고 다 합하면 촬영 됐어요. Mm -hmm. So it took about four years to make this film, um, and I made it because we never saw the Korean American perspective, and uh, 우리 부모님 관계 음. 뭐좀 달라요. 왜냐면 우리 부모님하고 우리 편히 얘기할 수 있어. 우리 계속 싸우고, 그 다음에 we make up, um, and then 계속 싸우고, and then we make up. And so that's our relationship, but that's not for everybody. So I guess for me is to have to just start the conversation. You have, unfortunately you have to initiate it first. 내가 이제 니까 하고 엄마가 아빠 너무 바쁘게 일했으니까 내가 억지로 계속 얘기해야 돼요. Because they're not gonna initiate it. 
it's going to have to do with me if I want that, um, unfortunately. I don't know if that's kind of amazing. Of course, and I think you answered it wonderfully.
everything's really about accessibility. Um, I think language accessibility is important too. Like knowing that everything is translated in Korean or like knowing that everything is translated in different languages so people could understand, hey, this exists. Like, you know, I never knew that there was a, there was this like connectivity grant or program through the government that allows people to get free internet. It wasn't until like, I learned something about that that I got free internet. Like, I think so much of it was things that we just don't know. That there's a lot of programs that exist, but we, we just don't know about it. And it's either we don't know how to ask, or we just don't know about it, or we just don't know how to navigate the systems. And I think it's just being more learning about that and trying to create more transparency or normalcy that you, you can. Um, that's kind of how I see it, but it's hard for me to really answer just because I haven't personally experienced like being tr like a truly an immigrant that like, comes to a new country and then trying to figure things out. I think that a lot of it is stifled because of language. And maybe there's, there should be free English classes for people to be able to learn English so they can have more conversations. I think that sometimes that does hold Im immigrants back because they can't access the language. Um, hi again. <laughs> One of the beautiful things that I liked in the film was showing the Korean American community performing their traditional Korean dances on skin I thought that was a very perfect uh, representation of magical realism, bringing beauty and magic in a space that was considered to be desolate. And so my question pertains to the role of culture and how when I present the culture of a particular people, I'm presenting their humanity. And if I present that first to set off the, the discussion on prejudices and biases, how does that indirectly disarm people from wanting to be defensive in uh, addressing prejudice, stereotypes, and biases that they have in the community? Um, when, you know, being a Southern Black American woman, right, it's very heavy for me when um, so many people, when the first connection they make, right, so many stereotypes of Black Americans being, you know, criminality, thieves, oppression, struggle, and, and people get this, this story, that these images as the, the symbol of Black American, right, but they miss out on all the culture and the humanity, they don't get to see that. Right? There have been immigrants who have spoken out and said how when they have come into this country, they've gone through the immigration offices, they've been told to stay away from black Americans. There's been a fear that's been pushed to stay away from them, they're bad people. Right? And so looking at that the documentary, we see that type of fear kind of come up in certain members of the Korean American community because that's the image of us that has been presented. Right? But if I put culture on the table, Right? And I show the culture of black American people that is its own culture, just as every has its culture. How does that invite people who, who struggle from prejudice and stereotypes to release the barrier of wanting to talk about that? And wow, this is another <coughs> side of this community that I've never seen. And this gives me permission to address something that I was taught wrong about. Yeah. I think so much of it for, at least me, because we have been stereotyped or there are so many images that are so false that I want to show ourselves in the most authentic way that I I cannot predict how other people perceive it. I can't think from like a non-Korean perspective of seeing that and being like, oh, it's too boring or something. Like I think for me, because it felt so seamless that I I think it was never a question. Like, it's part of us. We live and breathe our culture that we are going to represent it as seamless as possible. And I think that when I approach it, I always think of it, about it like food. People can access other cultures through food so easily. So you'll eat Indian food or Jamaican food or just anything without thinking twice about, uh, just thinking twice, as long as it's good, you know? So, and you might feel prejudiced, but I think it's always like with food, it's like a neutral ground in a sense. So I try to use that in the same way, just because I know that when you just show your authentic self, no one can deny that. 
no one can deny that that's not who you are just because these people actually are real people. They exist. And so, to me, it was always one of against whatever the movie has ever shown or hasn't shown. And so, that's kind of how I was approaching it. Well, Soya, thank you very much for making this about because real life is just so unpredictable and just so much more interesting sometimes than made up stuff. And yeah, I think there's so many issues that I've always been very interested in. Um, so I think for me, I, I, I always want to continue telling complex and really difficult subjects, especially pertaining into, like through the Korean American lens, whatever that may be. Um, so yeah. Feel free to keep in touch. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we're on social media. Tell your friends. I think we've, we've always known that this film will continue on and have a really long life and um, have a big impact as well. So thank you for coming. <laughs> share some free resources with you all. So at POV, we invite folks to come to our library to borrow films to host your own screenings. So if you're part of a student organization, a book club, um, an advocacy organization, and you want your, your staff and your team to come together to watch a documentary and speak about certain issues, I mean, film touches